So we have a wonderful panel here tonight. Uh, our next participant is a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Uh, he has made many influential and creative contributions to our understanding of the early universe, particle astrophysics and cosmology as probes of fundamental physics. Please welcome Matthias Zaldariaga. Our next guest is a theorist with a wide-ranging interest in fundamental physics, from high energy physics and string theory to cosmology and collider physics. He was a professor of physics at Berkeley at Harvard and Harvard before joining the Institute for Advanced Study in 2008. Please welcome Nima Arkani Hamid. Our final participant is an astrophysicist whose multitude of scientific contributions include observations and experimental astrophysics and space-borne instrumentation. She served as NASA's chief scientist and received the agency's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal. Currently, she is the head of the $7.5 billion uh, independent federal agency charged with advancing the scientific discovery, technological innovation, and science education. Please welcome director of the National Science Foundation, France A. Cordova. So first, let me just try to set the stage for our conversation here. Um, the past few decades have been fairly spectacular for fundamental physics. On the grand scale of the cosmos, uh, we have not only detected the cosmic microwave background, which is, you know, the afterglow of the Big Bang, but also by measuring the properties of this radiation, especially of the fluctuations in this thing, we were able to um, confirm a broad brush picture of our universe, what is within it, what its properties are. Uh, we determined six parameters to high accuracy that determine our universe. Uh, we know now a lot about, you know, what the universe is made of. We know that ordinary matter, for example, the stuff that we're made of, stars are made of, galaxies are made of, is less than 5% of the cosmic energy budget. About 25% or so, or so is dark matter, which is matter that, while has a gravitational influence, it does not emit or absorb any light. The rest 70% is in the form of some smooth form that fills all space, which we sometimes call dark energy. It's consistent with Einstein's famous cosmological constant. We measured the expansion rate of the universe, and we know that rate locally with an error no bigger than 2.4%, which means we can determine the age of the universe with that type of accuracy. Uh, I actually looked it up, and it turns out that the, all the medical techniques we have today, we cannot determine the age of a person with that type of accuracy. Wow. But we can determine the age of the universe with that. Um, so this is on the grand scale of things. On the small scale, um, we have a standard model of particle physics, where we know what we think are the basic constituents of matter. Uh, these are quarks, leptons. Uh, we also know the there are force, four force carriers, you know, carrier of the electromagnetic, of the weak, of the strong interaction. And this culminated in 2012 with the discovery of the Higgs boson, or at least a particle that has those properties, uh, which is, again, associated with the field that permeates all space and which gives mass, we think, to all the particles that we all know and love. So this is also an amazing achievement. We uh, discovered for the first time, man managed to detect gravitational waves. These are ripples in space-time predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity and for, looked for, for decades and we finally found them. So this is all amazing. Now, in spite of all of these enormous successes, there have been a few surprises, and some might even say disappointments at some level. So for example, in the cosmic microwave background, uh, 
there is a strong prediction from our model, which is called inflation, that you know the universe was when it was a tiny fraction of a second old, it expanded like crazy. Um, that there should be some imprint in the cosmic microwave background in the form of polarization, some some form. Now, those have not been detected yet. This does not mean they are not there. Uh, it's just that they haven't been yet uh, detected. Um, in the particle physics side, uh, there have been uh, strong predictions or expectations, I should say, that in the Large Hadron Collider, we will discover supersymmetry. That namely, that each particle that we all know and love would have a partner that has a spin that is half a unit removed from that. Those haven't been detected yet. The mass of the Higgs boson was a surprise to some. And in particular, it was thought that maybe the mass that was found means that there should be other particles in its vicinity. Those were not found. So basically, we understand now that there is still a lot of work to be done. So now I will turn to the participants here and you know, let's see how we can make progress. So I will start by asking each one of you to tell me very briefly, I mean in something like three minutes, uh, what are you working on right now? So, so I'll pass with you, Matthias. Great. So right now I'm working on two things. So I'm very interested in the things that could be left over from the very beginning, from the beginning of the hot Big Bang in the form of these small fluctuations that then grow to form the structure that we see in the universe. And the good thing about them is that they have a lot of memory. So when we look at things today, we can kind of play back the picture and try to understand how they started. And I'm interested in several of those properties and I'm uh, working in trying to improve the ways, um, the ways that we run this movie backwards to try to extract more information about how things started uh, because that's to me one of the big mysteries. Nima? Well, I'm thinking about uh, things on the two extremes that you uh, alluded to on, on the uh, very, very short distance frontier, very high energy frontier. For the past number of years, I've been uh, uh, thinking a lot about um, uh, how we could uh, uh, e experimentally study um, uh, in as much detail as possible and what we could learn um, uh, if we got this experimental information about properties of the Higgs particle. Uh, the Higgs particle is a very strange particle. We've never seen anything like it before. Um, and it's uh, more, more, uh, uh, more point-like than you would naively expect it to be. Um, uh, Namely, it has no structure. Yeah, there doesn't seem to have any, any structure. It seems to be like, uh, like purely point-like. It doesn't seem to have any sub substructure at all. And um, uh, a whole bunch of people are, are, um, are, are studying the prospects of having uh, uh, another accelerator after the uh, LHC it could be 100 kilometers around. Um, and one of the things that would do is, uh, is put the Higgs under a much more powerful microscope than we could get from the LHC and, and, and answer very basic questions that are going to be left open even after we finish running everything about the LHC, about this sort of burning theoretical mystery about its uh, sub substructure. In the opposite direction of uh, what literally working on, on, on the train on, on, on the way up here uh, is, uh, has to do with some questions about uh, cosmology. Uh, cosmology is just the most glorious of the historical sciences, but like all historical sciences, it has an interesting relationship with the notion of time. None of us were around uh, during the early universe, um, uh, but we infer this past and the Big Bang and even inflation and all this stuff because we make uh, measurements today at very late times about sort of correlations in space. Um, and we decide that the best way of making sense of those correlations in space is by inferring the existence of a time and a cosmological time and evolution that came before that. A lot like a paleontologist infers the existence of dinosaurs from the uh, existence of uh, big bones lying around. Um, but uh, for many reasons, we expect the notion of time has got to ultimately break down. It can't be fundamental, especially when we get back to the Big Bang. Uh, probably it's a notion of time which is breaking down. So that, that suggests, theoretically, there should be some way of talking about things without uh, making such heavy use of this concept of time. And so I've been working theoretically on trying to find some interesting uh, new mathematical structures that could uh, replace time in our understanding of where these spatial correlations come from. Right, and time would in that sense be an emergent property. Time would be an emergent just property, emerges, indeed. Yeah. Okay, yes. thanks. Okay. Franz, I, I realize that you know you are it's, it's somewhat different in, mm -hmm. in terms of what mm -hmm. you so in, in your case I would insist on I mean what is currently most occupying you, you know your time? I run a uh, 
big agency that funds all of science and engineering, everything except for the biomedical sciences, which the National Institutes of Health does. So we fund everything from social and behavioral sciences to geosciences, biological sciences, computer sciences, clearly physics, astronomy, chemistry, material sciences, mathematics. And, uh, and so on, I'm sure I left something out. We also run the US Antarctica program. And so we have a lot of science there at the South Pole, including an experiment that's called Ice Cube, which is a big neutrino detector at the South Pole, of about a square kilometer array of uh, photomultipliers that, are, that go down a kilometer into the ice and detect neutrinos from the heavens. But on the practical side of serving science, we're building some very big telescopes for the future, and we're also trying to uh, make better the telescopes that we currently have. So as one example on the gravitational wave experiment, we know there are lots of uh, noise that affects the, the spectrum, uh, the frequency spectrum, for detecting gravitational wave from seismic noise to thermal noise to shot noise. And so if we can improve the equipment, um, so those are technological advances that we are working on, and we have in, in the laboratories where, where these uh, uh, people work and uh, all over the country. We have young young people working on things like using quantum physics to squeeze light so we can get a big, better focus on the laser light source for LIGO. So we're trying to, to reduce, uh, increase the sensitivity, reduce the noise, and thereby be able to detect uh, sources of gravitational waves much farther out. So already this in this run that we're having now, which is called the second run of this uh, facility, we have uh, improved by a factor of 20 to 30 percent the sensitivity. So we'll keep going in that direction while also building a lot of new telescopes to observe dark energy, dark matter in the ways you talked about. And, and you hope to reach a factor of three, right, at least in your sensitivity? Uh, yes, w with the once current. Once everything is yes. said and done. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. Matthias, uh, I know that you have thought quite a bit uh, and pr presumably still work on this thing called non-Gaussianity in yes. the cosmic microwave background. So, uh, you know, everything in life we think is Gaussian. You know, it uh, depends on this bell-shaped curve. Uh, but in the cosmic microwave break background, everything is also Gaussian, but different theories predict a small you know, deviation from this Gaussianity. So explain to us a little bit, you know, what is involved there and what does it mean if it is being detected? Yeah, so I think uh, the, the first thing to, to um, uh, point out is that we are always looking for things that are left over from the very beginning and that the subsequent evolution of the universe has a difficult time changing. So, for example, a uh, natural thing that we would look, uh, try to look, see if the universe has a different composition in different places. But even a universe that started with different compositions, some physical processes in between can make the composition all the same. So you can erase, um, erase composition differences. However, um, when we look at the statistics of these fluctuations, this property, the Gaussianity of it, is something that uh, um, is pretty much impossible to... to um, at least on the very large scales, to um, erase. And so in that sense, it's kind of a very nice thing to look at because if we find it, it's telling us something uh, about uh, really the very beginning of how these uh, fluctuations that lead to structure um, arose. What it involves doing in terms of the observations is making maps of the universe as big as you possibly can because these are statistical measurements, so you want a lot of samples to uh, be able to uh, infer the distribution of matter in different, on different size scales and at different times in the history of the universe. So the bigger the map, the better, and, and try to learn how to interpret this in the best possible way. So, so just a small follow-up on this. I mean, uh, can you, do you think we can do this with the current existing data from Planck and WMAP or so on? Or does this need the next generation of cosmic microwave background detectors? Uh, well, these are things that, uh, well, the, the last generation of CMB experiments made a big pro big, big progress uh, on that. But basically, in the CMB, we've mapped the, the entire sky almost uh, up to the highest resolution that uh, we can possibly do it. Um, there is, uh, we, we can do better in polarization. So there is a little bit of improvement, but not a qualitative improvement. So I think uh, most probably to get a 
not just a little bit of an improvement, which of course is very nice to have, and, and we are working, people are working on it, and it will happen, but to have an, a, another order of magnitude, we will probably need to look for some other probes, mainly mapping the distribution of matter in the later universe, and, um, and there, the current constraints on Gaussianity from those, uh, from those surveys are, are significantly weaker than the ones that we have in the CMB. So it means that this field has to catch up quite a bit, learn how to do things, and it, it'll be the next few generations of, uh, of surveys right. that will do this and eventually, hopefully, uh, they, they, they'll, they'll catch up because indeed ma mo there's a big part of the universe we have not yet mapped. So in terms of our, the data that is out there, there's a lot. Nima, um, you know, we, we talked about, you know, some of these things that, that, you know, we now know and some of the problems that we have. I know that such people as uh, Sabas Dimopoulos and some of his students and ex-students and so on uh, work on um, tabletop experiments, which, uh, you know, I mean, uh, now... Matthias now talked about, you know, bigger experiments and so on, but this is a new type of experiments that perhaps can probe some of the things we're talking about, dark energy, dark matter, you know, and so on. Can you explain a little bit to us how those tabletop experiments work? Yeah, I mean, if I just put it in a, a little bit of uh, context, uh, we've uh, um, certainly the generation of people like me and Matthias have, uh, uh, have uh, lived through uh, three decades of uh, amazing experiments probing fundamental physics on every possible frontier. On you know, There's dark matter, the measurements of the universe, uh, colliders, um, uh, most recently the uh, LHC. Uh, and most of these experiments were imagined and conceived uh, by people in the 1980s who had a sort of vision for what the next 30 years was going to look like. And uh, uh, many of these experiments are in their last stages, and it's, I think, a very interesting time to, to think about uh, what the next 30 years are going to look like, because that's the kind of time scale we talk about in this business. You really have to think sort of three decades uh, uh, at on. Least, I would at say. least, yeah, if not, if not longer. Um, it's getting longer. So the, there are, of course, there's a, there's a whole uh, very important uh, new generation of uh, experiments that Matthias was just alluding to, to measure everything we possibly can about the distribution of matter um, in the universe, there's, I forget what the factor is, but maybe a factor of, uh, what is it, like 10 to the 8 times more data yeah. potentially uh, out there that we can get as human beings. 100 million, than, yes, 100 million uh, than, times. Uh, than um, uh, what, what, what we actually have. There's the experiments I, I alluded to earlier about uh, uh, taking the sort of next big step after the Large Hadron Collider, a factor of 10, 7, 10 in energy higher than that. Um, but there are some novel things that people are, uh, are talking about. Um, uh, which are mostly targeted at uh, looking for um, things that might be out there that could be related to dark matter uh, that are incredibly weakly interacting with us. Now, dark matter is, is one of the things that's uh, supposed to be incredibly weakly interacting with us par excellence, right? That, 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 that we're, we're supposed to think that, it, uh, that, uh, that we've only noticed its effects gravitationally, and, uh, and gravity is by far the weakest of all interactions there are. So um, most of the experiments over the last uh, 20 years that have been looking for dark matter have been assuming, uh, and there's various good theoretical reasons uh, why it's nice to assume so, have been assuming that the dark matter particle does participate in some of the interactions that we, we know about. Um, uh, the weak interactions that are associated with radioactivity um, uh, are an, an incredibly weak um, interaction, but still, it's uh, strong enough that people could design all these amazing experiments to look for dark matter particles, and in the range that they're looking for, there's sort of one of them in every liter in this room, you know, moving through the room at uh, one one thousandth the speed of light, um, and they would bang into like very cold, big vats of uh, liquid xenon, for example, and you look for the little shakings of the right. nucleus of these atoms. So those are the kind of experiments people have been doing for a long time. But it's possible that dark matter doesn't no look, look like that. With yeah, no we haven't results, seen anything. We haven't yeah. seen anything. Now, now um, uh, these things are called. Uh, this picture for dark matter is called the picture of WIMPs. Uh, the W in WIMP stands for weakly interacting massive particles, and the weak is actually, it really is a technical sense of the word, the weak interactions. It, it has that kind of strength uh, interaction. It's actually possible that the dark matter even is a very simple uh, picture of WIMPs, but that the interaction is just too weak. In fact, the very, very simplest, dumbest, most straightforward possible picture for what dark matter uh, could be, it just accidentally happens to be so weakly coupled that these experiments are not going to uh, see them. 
Um, but there have been also long been many other interesting examples of uh, particles that could uh, that could solve many theoretical problems and also be dark matter, things like uh, axions, for example. Right. And these are an interesting kind of particle. There are zillions of them surrounding us all the time. They have very small mass. So there are zillions of them surrounding us all the time. They are more strongly interacting than gravity, but way weakly, more weakly interacting than, than everything else. And so you need a totally different kind of experiment to go uh, looking for them. And um, what uh, the, the, this new generation of experiments that you're uh, referring to use cool methods from atomic physics. Um, uh, the, our growing ability to quantum mechanically manipulate fairly macroscopic objects in order to look for these things. Just, just to give you uh, one uh, example, um, if these uh, particles are out there and they're dark matter, uh, one of the predictions is that uh, the neutron, um, uh, the, uh, the neutron, which is a neutral particle, uh, would have a tiny so-called electric dipole moment. That would mean that, uh, that, uh, that it would be as if the neutron, while it's a neutral, has a little bit more charge in one direction in the north pole than in the south pole if it's spinning uh, with, a, with a spin going in the north-south direction. Um, and so, and that tiny, tiny electric dipole moment would actually oscillate with time. And so you can use fancy uh, methods from atomic physics, essentially using the, the same ideas from nuclear magnetic resonance, to uh, pick up and amplify that, uh, that uh, oscillating neutron electric dipole moment. Just to say, nuclear magnetic resonance is what is used in all your MRI imaging and so on. Right. So. So that's that's one example, and there and there are a number of other examples like this. But there's this new frontier of looking for uh, very weakly interacting things that could be, if they're if they're the dark matter could be filling uh, the universe around us, and that's uh, I think it's it's very exciting. Right, and maybe I should uh, also add, and maybe you can add a little bit too. I mean, some of these experiments also do these things with tiny, tiny micron size objects and you know in acting in gra gravity between such things which is a force that's uh, just about the weight of a virus um, yeah so and, and, so and, and, and testing how gravity changes on this type of scale just just so you have an idea what we we, uh, we often say that gravity is the weakest of all forces and uh, if you take a if you take a pair of electrons uh, their their uh, electric Repulsion is 42 orders of magnitude stronger than the gravitational attraction between them. That's so one in 40 zeros. One in 42 that. zeros. Yeah. So um, now, uh, of course, gravity looks like the most important force uh, here. It's keeping our feet to the ground and 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 so on. And that's because most objects are, in, in the end, electrically neutral, right? Like atoms are, are electrically neutral. But but you can ask, at what distance? If you take a pair of hydrogen atoms, at what distance do you have to put them so that gravity gets weaker than even the residual tiny, tiny little uh, uh, piece of the electromagnetic interaction that's left between them. It's called the van der Waals force. It turns out that that distance is around a millimeter. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, already at a millimeter, which is a pretty big distance scale, gravity is just getting swamped by, by these other uh, interactions. And so indeed, there are, there are people who manage to control, um, for example, the, uh, uh, the quantum mechanical coherence between two atoms that are separated by distances of this, of this uh, order. So you could actually try to measure and uh, see the effects of gravity right. on these very small scale things. Uh, Franz, uh, we heard here of, you know, large scale experiments and tabletop type experiments, mm -hmm. you know, and so mm -hmm. on. How does the NSF work in terms of prioritizing or not uh -huh. uh, big versus small experiments yeah. and so on? Because we're yeah. talking here about right. different classes of experiments, sure. things that cost billions of dollars and things that are tabletop experiments, which probably still cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe, but, you know, it's still like very... Tens well, of millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's okay, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's an interesting question from many aspects, because, of course, you know, even though we have, in principle, seven and a half billion dollars to spend, it's, it's just a drop in a bucket when it comes to funding of all of science and... Uh, engineering and so it's a question of how one sets one's priorities and how you balance little versus big things to invest in because you want to have an investment portfolio we all do want it in our personal lives that that balances for different objectives and goals and has a balanced portfolio so we really depend on the science and engineering community 
to be the major source of input for that. But believe me, we get a lot of input from other sources too. One major source of input is the National Academy of Sciences. So especially in astronomy and physics, we have these reports that come out every decade or five years uh, for the high energy physics thing every few years. Um, and those are those represent hundreds, even thousands of scientists and engineers coming together and decide and having these kinds of conversations just like this, only really intense about, you know, if we just build, you know, this kind of detector, then even though it'll take 10 years and so on. And so they, they put all that together in a report that Congress really respects because it represents different input than the agency itself. And we, we pretty much follow the guidelines of those reports. We just draw the boundary at how much money we have to fund them. And so we have, uh, we fund very big things that cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Like I mentioned in LIGO, altogether we've put in a uh, billion dollars plus. Um, and we fund, we have a program called Major Research Instrumentation in Universities that funds up to $4 million projects. The, the area that we're most worried about leaving out right now is, is the area in the middle that costs anywhere from say 10 to um, $100 million because we don't have specific pots of money designed for that. Uh, Matthias, I want to turn uh, slightly provocative here uh, in the following sense. Um, you know, we've, we've been looking for dark matter now for a long time and we've not found anything. Now, it is true that the dark matter particles, they have a lot of where to hide but still we have not found anything. So there are a few people, there are not very many right now, but there are a few people, one of them happens to be a good friend of mine, who suggests that there are no such dark matter particles, that instead we need to change our theory. And there have been historical precedents to this. I mean, you know, like, uh, when Einstein was there and there was ether, you know, and so on, the idea was not to have something that you don't see, but to change the theory. So, and similarly with the uh, precession of mercury, right? We had to change the theory. At what point, if any, do we say, well, maybe we shouldn't build even a bigger experiment or not. Let's think harder of changing the theory? Um, well, whenever there, if, if, if there comes a theory that explains everything and, and more things, then everybody will jump. To of the, course. The, so uh, what a, a problem is the, the, the lack of, the, of such a theory. But also it's important to realize that uh, um, dark matter was introduced, uh, uh, as you know, because of discrepancies in galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Uh, but that's nowhere not at all now from where we get most of our information or all of our information of about how dark, much dark matter there is or how it is distributed. It's from the cosmic microwave background. It's from gravitational lensing, all things that were not, um, were not there when dark matter first, the first anomalies that led to people to think about the dark matter came about. Um, and, uh, and so now the arena to try to, if you want to have a, another explanation, which by the way is totally fine, I, I think it's great to try to have, and, and a, lo a lot of people do it and it's not a problem at all, but the, where, you, where you have to focus your attention, in my opinion, is on the things that where it's most constra constraining, where we have the most information, percent measurements of the you know, abundance because of how it was distributed 400,000 years after the Big Bang and in the middle with gravitational lensing and later with galaxy clustering. So we have so much information. And the, unfortunately, even uh, you, you mentioned some of these frameworks, they were ad built um, to explain the original anomalies. Uh, right. But they have nothing to say about all of modern cosmology, I would say. And so it's they are so, at the moment, uh, so lacking of... Uh, of being able to use it anywhere where the excitement is, that that's the reason most people are not uh, using it for cosmology because it has nothing to say. I, I, I agree with you, but I will just a small follow up. I mean, partly, you know, maybe I'm just you know raising a, as, a, as a provocative possibility. Most people didn't accept these new frameworks to begin with, and so maybe not enough people have thought about this. 
you're right that the, these frameworks don't explain the peaks in the cosmic microwave background, but maybe because not enough people thought of trying to explain. I don't think that's uh, totally correct. People have tried. People came up with ways and tried to implement them, and they didn't work out. So there are people that are continuing to try, just to mention somebody, Justin Curry. Berlin. Berlin. There are many people that are right. trying to do it. So it's not the case that... And, you know, I... I think people should not take the the uh, do not should not think that in any way, shape, or form we are not trying to find the answer, right? So, if there's an idea, if and the, and people, you know, especially theorists, they like to speculate, and whenever there is something that rings a little bit true, they follow up. Mm -hmm. The problem is that they follow up, and and you know, the, the typical complaint about the theorist is that there is one event, and there's a of you know at the LHC or whatever, and a hundred papers, so. Every, you know, theories, we follow up everything. And the reason these things have not picked up, in my opinion, is because the grains of truth that, you know, ring, then when you follow them up so far, they lead to nowhere, right? While on the other hand, dark matter as a, as a particle, we have to remember the universe was much hotter than anything. Right. You know, collisions were much higher energy than anything we have probably in the laboratory. Yeah. Can I say a little, a little thing about this? I mean, because there's, there's, a, more general, there's a more general point here, which is... Um, uh, Often when, when, when we talk about dark matter and dark energy, especially in the context like this, there is, a, there is an obvious question. There's always some 12-year-old kid in the audience who asks, isn't it just like the ether? You, you guys are idiots. You haven't learned anything. You know, like the, every time you have a problem, you like invent some new crazy thing that's supposed to build, build the universe. And um, we, we know that. We, of, course, of course we, uh, we know that. The problem with history, and if you know anything about the history of science, you know that you can use, uh, you can take an example from history to illustrate any polemic point you want to make. Okay, in the in the case of dark matter, you, you alluded to already, but there are there were there were both two ways. there were both ways, and there was actually one astronomer, Laverrier, who was yes. involved in both of them. Uh, uh, Mr. Laverrier. Uh, predicted the um, location of uh, Neptune because there were some little anomalies in in the orbits of the uh, distant planets, and so that was dark matter back then. Dark planet was uh, you could all said, "Oh, let's mess up Newton's laws," but no, the right thing was conservative. Almost always the right thing is conservative. Vulcan. That's right. Then he predicted Vulcan because there was something wrong with the orbit of Mercury. <laughs> And he was wrong in that case, right? So, so that the same guy um, was, involved uh, was with right both sides. once and wrong once. So, so we, we never know ahead of time. Um, and that's why we always keep an, an open mind, especially, I'm just echoing what, what Matthias said, especially as theoretical physicists, we keep a, a very open mind. Um, as Robert Oppenheimer said, it, it's important to keep an open mind, not so open that your brains fall out. <laughs> uh, but you try to keep your mind as open as possible. And that's really the uh, difficult. I've spent time thinking about modified gravity. Right? And uh, I've written papers about it. Um, but uh, exactly what Matthias said is, is right, it, that there is a certain smell of truth of logical consistency, of inevitability, of something that works, um, which uh, is is nowhere near any of the attempts so far. It doesn't mean there might not be one someday, I, I but it's not like we're dogmatically beating people over the head who dare challenge Einstein. Believe me, if we could challenge Einstein yeah, and be right, we would. Surprise. It's the greatest right. thing we could yeah. possibly do. Yeah, so, right. so mm -hmm. the uh, the the. Uh, the, the difficulty in this subject is how to be radical and conservative at the same time. Um, and especially given that so much works so well already, uh, you can't just go crashing everything because, no, uh, because we have this incredible edifice that we've built up over 400 years. That's why we don't know ahead of time how radical and how conservative to be, and we try everything we can. There's yes. an, another point here. So we, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the gravitational wave observatory, and this is the first time in the history of the planet that we now have an observatory that can detect sources of gravitational waves. So what did the first three sources turn out to be? Something that we didn't even know existed. Right. Not something that, that can't exist, but nobody was running around writing papers about binary black holes, especially of those kinds of masses, of 20, 30 solar masses. And now we know that there's probably a very large population. So I asked one of your uh, contemporaries, theorist Ed Witten, um, at, at uh, MIT, um, I, I said, is, um, is it possible that they could form a constituent of dark matter? And he said, actually, in 
it's interesting question because in parameter space there there is a place for them to f to form you know not all of it but uh, but how how do we know you know we're we're just you set up an, an uh, you invent a new kind of technology uh, that can can detect the universe in a whole new way you discover a class of sources maybe there are many classes of sources and they don't have to be like that but but that's that's just the beauty of what we're involved in right now is that we're always discovering something new that's going to shed some light and who knows if if those will be connected to the dark matter question but they're certainly connected to the evolution of the universe in some way I, well, I just to say something very quickly about that since you uh, since it was something at the very end of your question to Matthias you said shouldn't we just uh, might might we better not be served by by thinking about something new rather than doing more and more complicated experiments. I was, and I think I the I know, I know you're being provocative, but but I think the answer is theorists are theorists and do what theorists do. We're cheap. Uh, but we should do every conceivable mm -hmm. experiment we can that we can do using the technology, the greatest technology we have at any time, to learn more about the universe experimentally, because surprises happen every single time we do. That's right. Uh, Nima, uh, I want to ask you um, and this this particular concept that I'm gonna bring up now actually raises the blood pressure of many of my friends, uh, but I know it doesn't raise your blood pressure and neither of Matthias. I want to bring about the multiverse. So basically, um, in recent years, I think it's fair to say that it's fairly recent. I mean, it's been around for a while, but, but not that long. Uh, theorists have come up with the idea, and there are all kinds of reasons for this, uh, that maybe our entire universe uh, is not all there is, but rather this is one member of a huge ensemble, which could be 10 to the 500, one followed by 500, or it could even be perhaps infinite. Call it infinite. Uh, yeah, of universes. Um, and um, the reason our universe has the properties it has is because those have to be consistent more or less with the fact that we are here. Uh, namely the values of the constants of nature and the laws of physics have such that they have allowed our thing, but there are many other universes which, in which the laws may be different, the constants of nature may be different, and so on. Um, there are colleagues, I'm sure you're very aware of, that regard this concept as the end of physics. I want you, because, why do they say it's the end of physics? Because they say, oh, well, since these other universes are not observable, then this becomes more like uh, metaphysics and not like physics because you cannot test it and so on. Now, I happen to know that you believe that this is not the case, and I want you now to explain this a little bit. Yeah, well, the discussions of the multiverse didn't use, I mean, they, they don't uh, raise my uh, blood blood pressure because of, uh, because I think there's something um, uh, intellectually long, wrong with talking about it, although my, my blood pressure does increase because an enormous amount of nonsense is said about it in both directions, both in the in, in pro and uh, con, con direction. So let me just say one thing uh, just uh, before, uh, just to set the context for the discussion. Um, even the theory, the idea that, that there's a multiverse is not a theory yet. It's not a, even a theory at the level that we're used to in the theoretical physics. Uh, there's all kinds of things that we talk about that we have not yet verified uh, are there in nature. For example, things like supersymmetry, right. uh, ideas uh, like that. These deserve to be called theories because we understand the, the, the theoretical structure well enough uh, to know what we're talking about, to make, uh, to say if this and this and that is true, then we can make a lot of other uh, predictions. It may or may not be realized in nature, um, but it still deserves to be called a theory. It's, uh, we understand the, uh, the ingredients. The multiverse is not like that. Um, it's at the, the, the ideas and concepts involved with the multiverse are at the very edge of the things that we even uh, conceptually know how to uh, talk about. I think of it as a caricature for something that might be true. It doesn't even rise to the level of a theory yet. How do you oh, try to so, verify? So let, let me let me say uh, I'll just take take them uh, take some of the problems one one step uh, at a time. One of the ingredients that you need for something for a picture like the multiverse to be right is uh, many uh, uh, what you uh, many approximate vacuums that one underlying uh, set of laws could have. Um, and just to stop yeah. you for one second, I mean, 
a vacuum is this thing which we would call a universe at some level, or a pocket universe. So you can have many vacua. It's a lowest sort of lowest possible, lowest energy state that, that we can have, where you just empty everything out, right? And, uh, and helpfully, in an expanding universe, that's what happens. As the universe expands, everything gets more and more dilute, and you approach more and more the uh, lowest energy configuration. Now, it's not a crazy possibility. In fact, it happens all the time in our simplest theories of particle physics, that you could have theories where uh, where, where you could have a lowest possible energy state and another uh, energy state that could have a different energy. And, um, and you could get stuck in these sort of uh, local places where, where locally you have the smallest amount of energy. But in order to go to find the place where you have the lowest possible energy, you've got to go far away and somewhere else. The second that becomes possible, uh, uh, we can entertain the idea that, uh, that, that these different possible uh, approximately stable um, uh, places could exist. That piece of the multiverse could, in principle, be verified by experiments in our universe. That so, could be, in principle, verified. So give by an doing, example. I'll, I'll give you an example. Now, now, we, we don't, we, since we don't know the, we don't know the the energies involved, but, but sort of for the barriers between one local minimum here, another local minimum there, those energies could be gargantuan. They could be much, much higher than energy any energy that we could make in the So think of a right. landscape which has valleys, but between right. them there can be huge mountains. Exactly. There are just enormous mountains. But if you have enough energy to climb over the enormous mountains, then you could make little bubbles of the other regions. And you can really make them. You could make them in a laboratory. You could send little elementary particles in and say, oh, gosh, I'm the Higgs particle. Out here I have this mass. In there I have a different mass. Wow. And it comes back out, and you can actually see all of that. You could in principle see that there was 10 to the 500 different possibilities. All of that you could actually, in principle, definitely not in practice as far as we can tell, but, but, uh, but in principle uh, it's not a question of philosophy, it is a question of uh, physics. What we don't know how to do, and this is the deepest conceptual problem associated with the multiverse, and, and if someone were to make a theoretical breakthrough on this question it could settle uh, certainly in my thinking, I'm sure in Matthias's and almost all of our thinking, whether this idea is, is, is a deep one or a crap one, okay, we still don't, don't know. The deepest conceptual problem is how are these different regions realized out there in the universe? And what you alluded to, uh, the fact that in our ex accelerating universe we only have access uh, to what, what we see now is what we're ever going to see. So uh, if there are these other regions out there, light from them will never make it to us, even in principle. That's a good reason to be suspicious about whether it actually makes sense to invoke them and talk about them. Um, we don't know if it makes sense to invoke them or talking about them. Invoking and talking about them is a little bit like invoking and talking about what's on the other side of a black hole, <laughs> of the horizon of a black hole. And um, you know, in the last uh, 20 years, we've understood that there is some subtle way that the quantum mechanics lets you see into the inside of a black hole and get the information about what's in there out. So it's possible that similarly, there's some very subtle way in which uh, uh, quantum effects now apply to the entire universe uh, will uh, help us make sense of what, what's going on behind the horizon out there in the multiverse. But this is a part which is totally uh, speculation at this point. Right. But, but imagine we did the experiments that showed that these 10 to the 500 different the environments existed. It would be very hard not to believe that uh, there should be, that, that they play some role right. in, uh, in, um, uh, in controlling the properties of our world. Right. And that part is not philosophy. That part right. is actually physics. Right. I, I, I just want to add two things, one very simple and one a little bit more subtle. And one is that you see, at the time, there was this great astronomer, Johannes Kepler. And he was really very smart, and he was the great astronomer. And he thought that he can explain why in the solar system there are exactly six planets. Six were known at his time. Because he thought that that is a fundamental property of the universe, which can be explained from first principles. Today, we know that's an accident, really. In this way, it could in principle be that some properties of our universe, which we now regard as fundamental, are in fact accidental. And you know, they get different values in these different members of the ensemble. Matthias, I'll ask you one more question, and then I want to leave enough time for the audience to ask questions as well. Um, you alluded to this, but I just want to sharpen it a little bit. Um, the very early universe, uh, is relatively simple. Uh, you know, only fundamental things happen there. But it is also far away and not that easy to observe. The nearby universe, we can observe more easily, but it's a mess. 
because it involves all kinds of processes of star formation and planet formation and galaxy formation and whatnot and so on. Is there a sweet spot somewhere where, you know, you get the benefit of both worlds? Well, I think the clear um, sweet spot is the cosmic microwave background. In the history of the universe, it is more or less much more in between. The, the, and that you, you perhaps are calling it the early universe, but it's 400,000 years after right. the Big Bang. So that's uh, pretty late for a lot of, uh, it depends. But um, So that's, then it, it's true, it, it, it gets more and more complicated. And that's, uh, uh, for example, when we were talking about the discussions about dark matter, um, when we start using our theories for dark matter to try to understand uh, galaxies or small enough things for, let's take galaxies, for example, then we're getting into trouble. Sometimes they don't seem to right. work. And that's the reason why people also are trying to find other... But it's also the case that all of the complications you alluded to, star formation, the black holes in the centers of each galaxy, they play a big role. We see it with our, our own eyes, meaning the telescope. So the more complicated things get, sometimes it's difficult to disentangle. And... Uh, that's why in cosmology we try to get uh, out, you know, just use galaxies, for example, as points, not uh, too much try to understand how they're made of, uh, but uh, um, just tracing where the matter is distributed. We never know where we will be able to make some breakthrough. And there, there are certain things that you just have to leave to the side, even if they're a very interesting problem, but you have to leave it to the side because it doesn't look like there's any, no progress is being made. And it's kind of the business of the... The game is like this. You speculate, you try to look for things, you, and you go on from there, right? I would like to open this for uh, questions from the audience. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a wonderful panel. Thank you. Um, obviously, mankind, when we discovered electrons, it, it changed our world. We now have electricity, all these wonderful things. Now, all these new particles that you're discovering, fermions and quarks and all these items, are we on the verge of taking these particles and revolutionizing our existence as humans? We don't know what, the, uh, what, uh, what fundamental breakthroughs in science will, will, will eventually give. Michael Faraday famously, when he was doing his experiments on magnetism in the basement of the Royal Institute in London, some British MP visited him and said, what is this good for? He said, I don't know, sir, but one day you will tax it. Uh, <laughs> and, and that happened 50 years later. Uh, can I think at the moment of any practical technological application of the discovery of the Higgs particle? No. However, when you get large groups of people to do very, very hard things, um, they, in they inevitably have to uh, come up with innovations that uh, have lots of other impacts. A uh, classic example from the field you're talking about is the invention of the World Wide Web, uh, which was invented at CERN to help experimentalists share this enormous amount of data with each other. Um, so even though it had nothing to do with the particles that they actually discovered, when you have people pursuing pure ends, uh, very difficult problems that are right on the frontier of what we know how to do, good things always come out of it, or have historically. But right. we also never do it for, we don't do it for this reason. Right, that's right. Yeah. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. That's right. So that, we that do it we because are, we are curious. curious. I mean, let me, let me say it another way. If you want to think about what's going to be exciting in technology 10 years from now, talk to people in Silicon Valley. If you want to wonder what might be exciting 50 or 100 years from now, it's going to come out of fundamental science. Yes, please. So if new technology reveals new theories, can we ever reach a final theory? And um, since all our theories currently evolve from the Big Bang, does anyone question the Big Bang now? I'm happy to take one shot at this and say that what I think we're all, we've all been doing is pushing the frontier uh, farther and backwards in time, all the time. And uh, when people talk about, you know, a final theory, I mean, Lord Kelvin famously thought at the end of the 19th century that all problems in physics were solved except for two small problems. And those two small problems uh, actually turned out to lead to general relativity and quantum mechanics. So two re big revolutions in physics. So I, I think that we have now discovered that the more we push, we find new questions. So it's not, I, I don't see any danger that we will run out of questions to answer at any point uh, in time. So, you know, in, in those terms, 
no theory is truly final. Theories in physics are, are really, you know, only theories that are good for the data available at a given time. But as new data become available, I mean, you sometimes have to modify a theory. Sometimes it becomes incorporated in a bigger framework, like in Newton's theory being incorporated in general relativity, let's say. Sometimes it has to be rejected altogether and so on. And, and this process, I believe, will continue uh, forever. So uh, that's the process we're going through. The, the Big Bang itself is not a theory, yeah. right? It's an no. observation. It's yeah. a collection of pictures from the past, right? And the, and pictures and things that we got from the past. So that will never go away. It's not a, it's just... A well, so I think the, the, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll echo the same thing and make a, a slightly more general point as well. Um, something I think uh, many people don't uh, appreciate is that there are, there's various really grand questions about the universe that, uh, that, that all of us get excited about. Some fraction of us decide this is what we want to do with their lives and, 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 we, and we attack them. Um, but there's something really fascinating as your, as your understanding of the world becomes precise enough so that uh, things really work. Uh, the character of the questions change, changes. The language with which you describe uh, the questions changes. Uh, and very often, the actual questions evolve. We, we don't even know what the right questions are until we happen to be in the vicinity of the correct answers and as we uh, happen to learn more. So you should not have this idea that we have this sort of fixed set of questions we've been working on for 2,000 years and we're getting closer and closer and we might hit the end. It's something much more interesting is happening, that, that we're, we're learning more and deeper and more profound things about the world that's allowing us to ask entirely new kinds of questions, things that we weren't even questions before become questions and so on. Uh, uh, going back to what Matthias said, we have as much evidence as we'll, uh, and we'll only get more, that, that, that the, Earth, the, the, the universe is expanding. As you run the picture backward in time, it got denser and hotter. And, uh, and that hot, dense early period of the universe is what we colloquially call the Big Bang. What you're referring to as the Big Bang, and many prefer, people refer to the Big Bang, is this sort of mathematical singularity of a point where everything starts back in time. And that's a thing which we don't understand. Uh, we don't understand, and what's very likely going on is, is that the whole notion of time is breaking down there. It's not a question of figuring out what came before. That the whole notion of time uh, was probably born there, or is certainly breaking down there. And if that sounds like a very tall order to figure out what it means, it is a tall order to figure out what it means. Okay, And that's what people are trying their best to you know, take little bits and pieces off that problem and make some progress on it. Is this gentleman over here? Is it felt that the universe is infinite? And if it is felt to be infinite, in what sense is it infinite? And how did something that was finite become infinite in finite time? Oh, the, the easy answer would, would be to say that we only see as, uh, some region of the universe and what's outside, I have no idea. That would be the, the standard answer that I would give. I don't know if it's infinite or if it's curved and it comes back and it's like the surface of a ball and it's really infinite. Uh, we don't know. For all we see, we don't see any curvature of this ball. Um, we, when we see further away, things look more or less the same. So we, it, does, it looks pretty much homogeneous. We clearly see that if it you know, finishes or it has a curvature, it's much bigger. The region that looks like the part of the universe that we can see is probably goes on for, for, for a while. Other than that, we don't really know. And uh, also, how this, start, this started is also some of the, you know, these are questions whose answer we don't know and whether or not our universe is connected to places which are completely different and it's so much bigger than, our, than what we see and the laws of physics are completely different. But just say I, one thing about the question of uh, finiteness because something very important happened in the late 1990s when we discovered the universe was accelerating, which is what we see in the universe, whatever you might imagine in your mind's eye, the universe going on and on, and that's what we've been uh, referring to. Um, uh, because the universe is accelerating, what we see now in the universe is what we're ever, ever going to see. Uh, that's kind of an amazing thing. Um, uh, ha if the universe was not accelerating, if there was a picture from what people talked about in the books in the 1980s, and the universe just kept expanding forever, then it would be an experimental question if it was infinite or not. If you waited long enough, your great, 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 great grandchildren would see more and more and more and more of the universe. We can't now. I mean, what we see now it was what we're ever going going to see. Of and so course, you're extrapolating right. that the acceleration of the universe exactly. will that's continue right. exactly. because yes, you yes. believe that's right. True, true. true, true. I'll, but, I'll, but, uh, I'll right. make I'll make. Right. This even sharper. Yeah. If the universe continues to accelerate as it does, then maybe a trillion years from now, 
actually, if astronomers still live here, they, they would not be able to see anything. Right. No, just not one any galaxy. other galaxy, right. just our galaxy. That's it. That will be it. And then all these stories about the universe, you know, this would be like mythology. You know? Okay, can we have this young woman here? If there is a multiverse, uh, how would our universe like interact with the other universes? How would that work? Do we know? Do you want to say something, Nima? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, um, most obviously it wouldn't. Uh, that's one of the problems. That's that's one of the conceptual problems. Is that uh, all of this stuff is out there and it's beyond our cosmological horizon. Um, which, because we're accelerating, we're, we're, we, we won't see we, we, we won't see any of that stuff. Now, that might make you think uh, that, uh, uh, and we've gotten very wary in physics for many good reasons. Um, uh, we've gotten very wary of concepts and ideas that we can't even, in principle, see. And what I'm just talking about is not a question of practicality, right? Our acceleration makes it impossible for light from those regions to uh, to um, uh, to reach like, us. To uh, reach us. Now, it's conceivable. Sometimes people talk about uh, um, if we came from some parent underlying uh, uh, vacuum that that gave rise to us, that there could be other little bubbles, and those bubbles could collide with each other. Uh, this is something that uh, people talk about. It's an in principle possibility. I have to tell you, it's it's so vanishingly unlikely to uh, to uh, happen that uh, if you hear about it in the press, you should be very skeptical. It's not. Um, uh, I mean, even theoretically, it's incredibly unlikely for it for it to happen. But it is, in, in principle, possible. Now, but having said all of this, uh, uh, the, uh, and this is part of the reason it's theoretically uh, difficult. Um, if it was clear that nothing about these other vacua, these other regions, could have any effect on us at all, then we would be almost certain that it's garbage and we shouldn't think about it. But it's not 100% obvious. Um, and the reason is that you can imagine other parts, or you can imagine futures that we could have, where if we exited our vacuum, but we went into another kind of uh, vacuum in the future, those observers could look back and look at the night sky and see, eventually, if they waited long enough, all these collisions happening with all these other bubbles, and they could see, if you waited long enough, there was somebody that could see the entire multiverse. It's not us. <laughs> But in principle, there are some people that if you waited long enough, uh, uh, you could. But, but anyway, but the short answer to your question is in no conceivable way we can imagine now, other than these vanishingly unlikely uh, things involving collisions of bubbles. Thank you very much, Nima. Thank the panel, and thank all of you for attending. <laughs>